Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Liu Zheng from MSC NTU. And today I'm also the host of uh, this session. Uh, we are very honored to invite uh, Sir Konstantin uh, Novoselov to give us the plenary talk on the future materials. And uh, uh, Sir Konstantin received master degree from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in 1997, and he received PhD degree from Rambam University, Namigen in 2004. He is now a distinguished professor in the National University of Singapore. He is a Nobel laureate in physics in 2010 for his groundbreaking experiment regarding two-dimensional material, graphene. And in addition to this, he also won the Fellowship of Royal Society, Foreign Associate of US Academy of Sciences, and many others. Now, let's welcome Sir Constantine to take the stage. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. So it's, uh, it's been really, uh, re really a pleasure to work with you so the, over the number of years, and it's uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here uh, today as well. So I I, uh, I I gave a talk at the GYSS several years ago. It was most pleasant uh, pleasant experience. So I'm back, and I'll try to I'll, I'll try to update you with with a few things which are which are happening in our lab, but also uh, in the uh, generally in the world in terms of new smart materials and uh, and and designer materials so but probably a good place to start is uh, is uh, is graphene uh, sorry about this not not because necessarily graphene is the future but it's really it, it provides quite a, quite an uh, a nice platform for for designer materials. So many of you do know what graphene is, is the thinnest possible material, only one atom thick, very simple, consists only of carbon atoms, and yet it has a number of superlatives, like it's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's the thinnest possible material, the strongest, most conductive, thermally conductive, impermeable, and so on. And because of that, it, it, it has been proposed to, to be used for a number of different applications ranging from uh, composites to uh, to biosensors, from uh, flexible electronics to to uh, to to energy, and indeed, so although it's uh, it's quite a special material in, in terms of science, we've been playing with it for a number of years now, and keep supplying us with um, with with new exciting phenomena up to now it's actually in terms of the applications it's it it, it it follows quite nicely the footsteps of many other advanced materials before it and i'm sure of advanced materials after it so it started its way into applications from the uh, simple applications in composite mainly in, in sport goods so ourselves we worked with richard miller and, and mclaren to create this world lightest watch and then uh, we use graphene panels for uh, for the composites in uh, in those in those sport cars, actually f not for the sake of the strength or, or or lightweight, but for the sake of the thermal conductivity, which allows you to speed up the the the, the process of production. And then uh, and actually these days most of the uh, of the Ford mode uh, of Ford models do use graphene again for quite interesting applications of noise noise absorption from the hindsight you would probably guess that um, having uh, lots of interfaces uh, in the 2D composites would, would allow you efficient scattering of the phonons and then from noise can, uh, noise cancelling to noise creation there are um, several uh, companies which are working on graphene membranes for uh, for uh, for the headphones, so th so this is the example from the Aura. It's a company in Canada. So w so w w what you need here is the lightweight, but uh, but uh, also extremely stiff material, and that's that that's all that's all graphene. And then go into more electronic applications like um, thermal spreaders, uh, which uh, which is used by by Huawei. 
and uh, interestingly graphene is now the material of choice for uh, for the quantum resistance standards and uh, for example NPL in London do use to use graphene for for the for the quantum hull effect so and then these days electronic applications start to be more and more dominant so there are uh, companies which produce uh, uh, extremely sensitive photo detectors based on graphene and 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 quantum dots and if i need to to predict then uh, telecommunications would probably be one of the most interesting areas of application for graphene but also for many other 2D, 2D crystals. And actually, personally, I think uh, what is really exciting about graphene that is the thinnest possible membrane, and we need to investigate this um, this direction of uh, of, of research and, and applications much much more strongly because it's of course it's impermeable for uh, for for any atoms, but at the same time it can be made. Um, permeable for some specific species so we can use it for selective uh, selective membranes smart smart membrane uh, uh, applications so that's um, uh, that's that's basically been uh, uh, work for uh, around uh, around graphene uh, and in terms of science and in terms of applications for a number of years of course it it, it, it all won't be possible without uh, advances in mass production and the technology of uh, of of graphene uh, as well because we started long we started long time ago with the scotch tape exfoliation production of uh, of graphene when you take a piece of graphite it's the material which you find in your pencil and then exfoliate it with the with the scotch tape uh, however of course it's it's not really uh, mass production friendly method these days however there are many other ways how to how to produce graphene in large scale right, depending on the quality you want to achieve and the price you want to pay starting from liquid phase exploration is the technique which which is really good for um for uh, such applications as coating composite energy biosensors to uh, CVD production, which is which gives you the electronic grade material, as well as some uh, some some other uh, newish way of epitaxial uh, graphene production. However, this is just uh, just the the beginning of the story because uh, if you uh, if you are if, if you like, you can ask you, you, yourself a question. Okay, if I use a scotch tape and I exfoliate graphite in my uh, lead pencil, I get graphene. What what happens if I exfoliate other pencils as well? And the answer is yes, you can do it. And actually, if you do it, you would you can you can produce many other um, one atom thick materials, one at, uh, two dimensional materials, which would have um, which are which are similarly thin as graphene, but will have completely different properties. So these days we are talking about not only about graphene, but we are talking about the whole family of two-dimensional crystals which are available to us. And there are many, 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 um, uh, many dozens of members in this in this family. And actually, our host today is the expert in in the preparation of those of those crystals. We can discuss it later during our our question and answer uh, and answer. Uh, session but um, that really gives us a lot of new opportunities well first of all because we it gives us the opportunity to study the properties of those two-dimensional crystals because physics in two dimensions always different uh, from the physics in in the three-dimensional crystals and now we have two-dimensional insulators two-dimensional semi-metals uh, semiconductors conductors ferromagnets superconductors so the physics itself is uh, is extremely uh, extremely uh, exciting what you can find in those in those uh, in those materials but also it gives us quite a, quite an interesting opportunity and here i would like to diverge a little bit and just give you uh, a bit of a motivation why do we need 
to see new opportunities in terms of in terms of the material science. So generally, you would know that materials are extremely important uh, you know, for for the development of the of the humankind. So we even call the ages we live in by the names of the dominant materials. Like there is the Stone Age, there is the the Iron, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. And a good question would be, uh, which age do we live in, in now? Um, and probably for the first time in history, we have quite a choice because uh, we, we can call our time the digital age or the silicon age, maybe nuclear age, because most of the electricity we produce is now, is now from, from nuclear. But it's important to make, um, to make uh, a smart choice or maybe we don't need to, to to make a choice. Maybe it's it's actually wrong to bet only on 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 one material. Let me give you an example. So here is the uh, periodic table of elements which we use in our uh, silicon technology prior prior to 1990. So very so those uh, very very simple technology. So it's uh, silicon, boron, phosphorus for doping aluminum for interconnects, hydrogen oxygen for passivation, that's it. So very simple technology, even I could probably understand. Then uh, we added some, uh, later we added some copper for interconnects. We had to add a few other materials to provide the diffusion barrier, the work function matching material for, for the contacts, but still manageable technology. These days, we basically use more, more than half of the periodic table for uh, in our silicon technology. And the situation is quite bizarre because if I show you that uh, there are less elements in our own body than we use in the uh, in um, uh, in uh, silicon technology, and you would guess with me that uh, that our cells we are much more versatile than than. Uh, than our our silicon chips, so and that's quite a that's quite a common problem because uh, we only bet as human beings we only bet on a few materials in our technology. So our electronics is all silicon construction. It's based on steel. Uh, space engineering it's the aluminium, bit of titanium. So a few materials means that we all that we limit our opportunities to those few. If if the Electronic engineering needs to create a new, a new, uh, a new system, a new device. He or she would need to look at the tables, what silicon can do for me, and then design a new device within those restrictions of the band gap work function, band gap of the silicon oxide, and so on, and so on, and so on. Ideally, of course, you don't want those those restrictions. You would like to have. Uh, material which, which where you can vary all those parameters and those materials do exist so we call them the composite materials or the heterostructures so we do we use them in our electronics and in construction and in airspace but still there are few and far between examples of those composite materials ideally of course you want to create material from scratch by atom by atom or layer by layer engineering and then you would be able to uh, design a material according to according to to your needs and that's actually exactly what we have now with the two dimensional crystals because of course we have a full library of those materials where those are available in their monolayer form but now we can go back into three dimension and create a heterostructure of materials according to uh, to what we need to what kind of properties or functionalities we want from those from those crystals and indeed it has been realized and many many groups in the world do work on this uh, technology it's called layer by layer material engineering or van der Waals technology and um, quite a uh, quite a number of really uh, exciting uh, phenomena and interesting devices have been created using this uh, technology so here is an example of such a quite a complex uh, device based on this on this uh, technology it's a light emitting diode so you apply voltage you get light out of this this structure so graphene plays only secondary role as a transparent coating transparent conductive coating here so the the, the major part is played by those uh, semiconducting quantum wells so and that's that's all great. And maybe I just spent five minutes uh, of uh, just to update you what is the progress of the last couple of years in this in this area because 
uh, the what what has been realized that those uh, heterostructures are quite unique because we can control not only the sequence of layers which we, we which we are putting together, not only the number of layers of each individual material, but also how we uh, how we rotate those crystals in in space uh, with respect to, to each other. And what people realize that if you rotate crystals in space, the their electronic structure, their brilliant zone also 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 rotate in space and then if you allow hybridization between those electronic structures you can gain uh, really uh, exciting properties new exciting properties out of it and that's indeed has been the breakthrough uh, by the MIT group who demonstrated that in a very simple um, setting just two layers of 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 graphene when you when you rotate them you can get such phenomena as superconductivity or uh, or uh, ferromagnetism or more insulation. So the uh, ferromagnetic structures has been uh, 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 produced in twisted monolayer bilayer systems. And these days we basically, so it's quite an interesting the direction of research, how to control the properties and the functionalities of those of those crystals by uh, by um, uh, orientation. We simply take the same material but twist them under under different angles, and then we get uh, we get new properties out of it. For example, you can take um, boron nitride, which is the insulating counterpart of graphene, and if you rotate it, you can produce a, a ferroelectric uh, material uh, out of it. So it's quite a, with quite a microscopic ferroelectric domains. Or uh, there was um, there was quite a, um, quite a bit of work on the production of uh, of um, uh, of the transition metal dichrocagonides and then if we have high quality uh, niobium deselenide crystals and if we uh, if we uh, twist control them, we can get new superconducting states within those within those those twisted regions, and those new superconducting states is because of the Mora pattern and the different stacking between between the uh, different parts of those of those um, superconductors, which which form an array of the of the of the Josephson junctions. So that's really um, gives us fantastic opportunity in creating new materials on demand materials with the predetermined properties with the properties which you won't be able to 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 obtain uh, otherwise through uh, through through uh, any other means. So that's um, that's already great and that's already gives us uh, really uh, a, a nice platform of getting tailored material. So now we can uh, we, we can produce uh, on demand properties for uh, for for any new applications. But also we would like to go a little bit beyond that and here is and I would like to spend 10 minutes maybe to uh, telling you what's the what's the future of materials as we as as we see it uh, in our labs that uh, I don't think that uh, simply predetermined uh, materials with the predetermined uh, properties is enough I think we need to have much more from our material world than, than that I think we need to have smart material and again uh, let me just um, uh, do a little bit of the the version a little bit of the of the background uh, so uh, and um, so uh, uh, I would I would like to just to, to say that we also uh, so um, a bit of the of the background here so I guess many of you do do remember um, this this movie the 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 Terminator so this this movie was shot in 1991 and it was uh, about this robot which was which was uh, which which uh, traveled back to 1991 from 2029. So that's how we thought our robots in 2029 would look like, um, made from liquid metal, agile, changing changing uh, uh, changing shape, self self adapting, self self healing, and so on and so on and so on. So we are in 2022. And that's the that's the robots which we've got which we've got these days, and I I, I guess you would you would uh, agree with me that the reality 
we're a little bit outside of uh, where, where we want to be in, in 2029. It's still okay. We still got seven years, seven years to go. But unfortunately, I've got bad news for you that unless we change the, the very attitude to our technology, we won't be able to arrive at those liquid metal robots in, in, in 2029. And the problem is really with the, with the very attitude, with the very basics of our uh, technology, which uh, uses the so-called top-down functionality. So it, because individual parts, the materials which we use, they're not functional. The functionality only comes when you assemble those individual pieces all together and then they gain functionalities. And that's not only about the clockworks or about the about the robots, it's about many other technologies as well, like in electronics and membranes and energy and so on. Our uh, technologies start to be functional only once we assemble them into the into the system level. The situation is actually very different in biology where where in the biological systems the functionality is distributed across many different levels. So individual proteins or viruses, they're functional in their own respect, membranes, um, uh, cell level, organ level, our body. So the functionality is distributed and that's exactly why we're so efficient and 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 so and so versatile. And that's exactly what we want in principle from our materials that they would be uh, functional and intelligent on their own uh, in their own right. Functional means that they can be programmed to um, to form a complex response to external stimuli, and intelligent that they would have memory to learn for for a particular function. So let me just give you an example of such um, of such materials. So I told you already that you you can make a, a, a nice membrane. Um, uh, uh, siphon membrane from uh, from from graphene and you can you can uh, make it for example uh, for water desalination but at the same time we can actually if we combine it with some other other materials you can make it into a smart membrane which would be able to sense the uh, conditions of the of, of the water which is passing through the moment it senses the contamination those parts would change their uh, their um, their configuration and would close the pores and then and and then stop stop the water flow and that's and, and that's uh, what we want from our from our system so he, here is the another example this is from colleague of mine in in the US, Guy Bazan, who works on the conductive polymers uh, in uh, in conjunction with the live bacteria and they grow to, to, together and bacteria during their metabolism cycle they can emit electrons which is which is collected by the uh, by the by the conductive network and it's it's a self adaptive developed system which you can use as a, a, a as a battery but basically it is based on live bacteria which grow together with the with the conductive with the conductive polymers and that's and that's exactly what we what we're trying the idea which we're trying to push into other areas of uh, of technology as well like neuromorphic computing smart membranes smart energy and uh, and so on Unfortunately, uh, there are, it's, it's, it's not that, that simple because the moment you start to demand memory functions from your, from your material, you uh, in, uh, immediately need to, have, um, need to have out of equilibrium systems. So systems which, are, uh, which, uh, which can develop and switch between different, uh, different states. And that's not what we are good at. Uh, so most of our uh, physical, um, uh, uh, our physical approaches, they're based on the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium conditions, and then we apply uh, perturbative schemes to 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 study out of equilibrium phenomena so and that's a, that's exactly what we are trying to do is to figure out how can we describe these uh, those functionalities which are uh, uh, properties which evolve evolve in time and how can we predict the structure of the material 
to give us the 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 specific functionalities so uh, we, we do un understand uh, the basic principles how can we create such materials so they should be created on based on strong interactions between components and those interactions sh should go through multiple different channels and then you should be able to get a degenerate energy landscape and degenerate energy landscape means multiple minima so it means that you can trap your material in one state or or or, or another and then controllably move between those steps very similar to uh, to the folding and unfolding of of proteins uh, so the reason our proteins are so versatile so efficient at performing multiple functions is be exactly because they can be uh, assembled into different configurations and the energy landscape is uh, is uh, is extremely degenerate so you can easily transfer from one uh, from one minima uh, to uh, to another so we basically work now not with uh, low dimensional material. The reason we, we, we need low dimensional material is because when you put two materials together, two bulk materials together, they only interact at the surface. They don't interact uh, through the bulk. So we want to avoid that. We want strong, strong interaction. So we work with 0D, 1D, 2D, some 3, 3D materials without bulk, like morphs and calls. And then we assemble complex heterostructures out of it in such a way that they would be responsive to external stimuli, but also would have some feedback to change their internal configuration as well. And um, based on these principles, we really try to apply it for a number of, of different applications. Let me skip this. And um, I probably just mention a couple of those, of, of those existing, of those um, applications which are um, which already already exists so one quite uh, so the most efficient way is to produce the uh, heterostructures based on 2d materials and polyelectrolytes 2d materials give you quite a predictable response to lights or or or, uh, or electric field and polymers especially polyelectrolytes they're very uh, sensitive and selective towards the, the towards the environment and then if you if you create heterostructures based on those on those materials you can tune it for a, a particular response for a particular stimuli but also you can make them to change their their uh, their internal confirmation confirmation uh, uh, upon uh, upon a given stimuli so it can be a smart material so we used it for uh, ion separation for uh, we're trying to use it for drug delivery we also make them into self so self healing material that you can scratch it and then expose to a certain stimuli and then it it, it would just it would it would heal itself uh, uh, um, on uh, in the uh, in their own right so here is another example um, uh, so we, uh, we the work which we're doing in collaboration with John Wen Liu and it's a it's a high high entropy alloy but basically the idea is exactly the same that we store it in a, we store this material in a metastable state and then upon uh, if we if, if you make a defect inside you can you can uh, make it to self heal and then uh, self adapt and, and and grow grow back and that's that's all due to the uh, smart navigation or in the energy landscape and the, the direction of the uh, of the entropy uh, entropic part of the of the of the free energy so i think i would uh, i would i would stop here and i will say that um materials which can be programmed in terms of their of their properties but also which can be which can be made functional and and adaptive is the future of the of the material science and it would give us a, an opportunity to uh to completely revolutionize many areas of, of our of our technology so thank you so much and thank you so much for your for your attention thank you. okay uh let's thank uh, Costilla for this fantastic talk here uh, I'd like to uh, put up the first question so as uh, uh, you have uh, discussed in your uh, slides right you give us a very pleasant journey material journey from the uh, single graphene to multiple 2D materials 
and then we go to the complex uh, functional intelligence material, right? Um, we can do more and more now, more and more functions can be realized. So I believe uh, the audience may be keen what is the key challenging or key challenges in this uh, complex system? Well, um, of course, well, it's indeed very mm -hmm. exciting to work with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with those materials. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, at, at this moment of time, we're really uh, only starting to, work, to create those mm -hmm. complex heterostructures and we have to work on our mm -hmm. basic physical intuition. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can guess sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, what, mm -hmm. the, what the properties of this or that heterostructure would okay. be. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we, we, it's still very challenging to predict exactly mm -hmm. through, through our uh, theory method, uh, methodologies mm -hmm. uh, what's, the, uh, what's the outcome of those, uh, of those structures mm -hmm. uh, will be. So that's, um, I think that's the, that's the major, um, that's the major area which we need to 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 improve and we work a lot on the applications of ai towards the uh, the material science and that's um, i think that's uh, quite a promising the, the, the direction which would allow us uh, better uh, larger throughput calculations on 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 the complex materials and generally the origin of complexity and the moment um, when uh, when uh, Maybe, maybe uh, there is a moment when you cannot pre predict at all the properties mm -hmm. of those materials. So that's the that's the origin of complexity, and maybe that's the origin of of living materials as well. Okay, uh, thanks, Kostya. We got a lot of echoes from the audience. Uh, here, uh, let me see. Uh, this question is about the two D material. For uh, how likely are two D materials to be adapted for nano medicine, for example, drug delivery, cancer detection. All right. Well, I, I, I should say that uh, of course there are lots of lots of um, uh, work and uh, lots of studies mm -hmm. in terms of the applications of nanomaterials in general and two D materials in particular for uh, for for different uh, nano medicine mm -hmm. applications, either either drug delivery or uh, smart sensors, mm -hmm. or uh, or uh, 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 or uh, um, oncology mm -hmm. uh, therapies. Mm -hmm. So there are. Uh, it's uh, it is definitely on the on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Generally, and uh, what I see in the mm -hmm. literature, at least in in the research, there are many many exciting uh, 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 progress there, mm -hmm. and there are a number of startups startup companies mm -hmm. in in different areas the problem is that of course um, medicine is extremely ex extremely uh, uh, is extremely a conservative area as it should be because mm -hmm. because you don't you, know, you don't want to produce any harm and unfortunately the interaction of uh, of um, biological systems, with uh, with uh, with any any objects on the mm -hmm. nanometer scale mm -hmm. is still is still uh, is still uh, very badly understood. So uh, understandably, it goes uh, it goes at its own pace. Mm -hmm. But it, at least in terms of research, mm -hmm. uh, it looks uh, it looks extremely promising. Okay, many thanks. Uh, one more question is about uh, the graphene. If two layer of graphene show interesting properties, so uh, what's about increasing the number of stack? Could it show new property? How many stacks of graphene that can that is for two D materials? Right. So okay, that's uh, so the um, it's a good question and it's a valid it's a valid question of course and <laughs> and uh, we loved graphene for and we still love graphene for its simplicity that mm -hmm. you can you can produce produce a very predictable result once you once you understand it mm -hmm. but indeed two layers especially twisted produced mm -hmm. uh, very uh, uh, very new phenomena mm -hmm. and we do study uh, uh, three layer two plus one uh, two plus two uh, and so on and they the they all show mm -hmm 
very exciting physics. The problem is that mm -hmm. it's uh, the complexity increases as well mm -hmm. at, at the same time, and um, and the uh, the naive and uh, very um, hand waving understanding is mm -hmm. not always possible once mm -hmm. the 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 complexity increases. So. Um, just to give you an example, if mm. if, if you take uh, three layer three layer graphene, mm. so you get you get uh, you get a semi metal. Mm. However, if you shift the the top mm. layer by half of the unit cell mm. to, to so called uh, ABC yes. ABC mm. stacking, mm. you would immediately get a, a topological insulator with which is an insulator with the uh, with the surface state. Mm. So it's uh, it's extremely rich mm. area. Mm. And um, in terms of study of the physical phenomena of the many body physics, it's extremely rich and we still work a lot on it in, in our lab, but actually in many, many labs across the, the globe. And uh, I think we'll still see a, a quite a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, breakthroughs in, from, from such systems. Yes, I agree with you. Actually, instead of stacking, we can also twist it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, so. <laughs> that's, kind of yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's 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 uh, really powerful technique, and uh, <laughs> so uh, it's quite mm. surprising that what's now good fifteen years down the line, um, a material a material mm. as simple as graphene still, mm -hmm. and we're still playing with it. So, mm. so yeah. okay. Uh, here the interesting question about quantum computing we just discussed, right? Uh, dear Professor Costia, uh, may you explain whether there is a chance of employing 2D magnet van der Waals material as a potential application in quantum computing? Oh, okay, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's that's something something very new. So, of course, you um, uh, you know that. Uh, so there are several competing mm -hmm. technologies in 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 quantum computing. They uh, originally started uh, uh, with uh, with um, arrays of Jacobson junctions. Now switching more towards towards uh, cold atoms, um, and, and uh, that's uh, and the reason for that mm -hmm. is is uh, is uh, the uh, the representability that mm -hmm. it's very difficult to create identical identical um, uh, uh, identical uh, Josephson junctions. So mm -hmm. the what what I showed you today arrays of the Josephson mm -hmm. junctions due to Moira pattern mm -hmm. can be. I mean, it's it's difficult to control them mm -hmm. in its own right, but it's but at least you get you get the uh, this arrays mm -hmm. of the uh, of the identical Josephson junctions. So it's mm -hmm. the crystal of of Josephson junctions. Um, in terms of the of the magnetic materials, mm -hmm. of course you can you can get um, you can get unusual magnetic states and 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 and, and correlated states as well mm -hmm. uh personally i'm not aware of the of the uh proposals of using 2d mm -hmm. materials for the quantum computing but uh, mm -hmm. again it's uh, it's not exactly my area of expertise mm -hmm. so um i'm sure what i'm sure that we will mm -hmm. see very interesting quantum mm -hmm. correlated states in uh 2d magnets mm -hmm. in heterostructures of 2d magnets in twisted to the magnets, mm -hmm. going towards quantum computation is um, uh, it's, is the next step. So I, I cannot I cannot comment on that. It's in the near future. So the following question is: uh, Have people used smart material to aid the development of practical quantum compute, quantum computers? Well, um, not n not yet. As I said, there are. Uh, several leading leading directions in in terms of the uh, of of quantum computers and the uh, technologies for 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 quantum computations. Mm -hmm. We're trying to use quantum computers for uh, to model those complex materials. So that's a, that's a different a different direction, um, and just uh, as the, is is the so-called quantum quantum simulators. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, 
there haven't been any any proposals on the use of the of the of the smart materials for uh, for quantum computers. But uh, as I said, there are definitely very mm -hmm. untrivial quantum states which we can create and develop in many different mm -hmm. um, uh, heterostructures, either either graphene or twisted um, uh, superconductors or twisted ferromagnets. So the correlated states are definitely, uh, can be very, mm -hmm. of, of very uh, uh, unusual nature. How to mm -hmm. control them and be, uh, and perform quantum operations, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a, a difficult question, but mm -hmm. I cannot say definitely no for that. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about the commercialization, okay. Although there is a lot of research on graphene, commercialization is still far off. Why uh, this commercialization uh, technology gap? And why so much uh, research on graphene has been abandoned? Well, I, 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 would, <laughs> I, won't, I won't immediately say that it, that it, is, it, is, it is not there. Of course, there was mm -hmm. like maybe seven, eight years ago, there was a hype on Mm -hmm. uh, on the applications of graphene mm -hmm. and we thought that uh, one day we just mm -hmm. wake up and everything around us mm -hmm. would be made of, of graphene. But that's, of course, mm -hmm. a very naive picture. Uh, actually, you probably have more, more, uh, more graphene in your life than, than you realize. So mm -hmm. like most of the uh, mobile phones by, by Huawei do, do use graphene. But, uh, so graphene is used is being used by uh, hundreds of tons mm -hmm. for batteries applications mm -hmm. for uh, for for photo detectors mm -hmm. and so on and so on uh, and so on. So uh, you probably do do come across graphene mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. uh, several times. Uh, it just it's a, it's not a it's not a revolution it's a quiet evolution mm -hmm. but but that's that's generally how things how things are in this area and of course um, um, what people need to realize that that uh, every that, uh, that uh, unfortunately uh, getting exciting research sometimes mm -hmm. uh, uh, or I'll say mm -hmm putting materials into technology mm -hmm. can be sometimes more difficult mm -hmm. than uh, than making exciting research mm -hmm. because uh, and that's exactly the the uh, problem which i ad addressed before because you have to be to retrofit mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. so your new devices needs to be compatible with the mm -hmm. with all the previous technologies mm -hmm. And you cannot imagine how many restrictions mm -hmm. our silicon technology is is giving to us in mm -hmm. terms of the temperature temperature range, mm -hmm. the and the uh, the vacuum level, the, the type of materials, and so on. So I would disagree that uh, mm -hmm. that that uh, it is behind in terms of applications. It, it goes mm -hmm. exactly at the pace of mm -hmm. any other uh, uh, ma new materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, which have ever been introduced into technology. Mm. So actually, this question uh, remind me uh, application about graphene that is uh, uh, cell phone. So mm. graphene has been has been using cell phone to code down to code on the cell phone. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's and it's quite surprising that made from uh, individual flakes. It mm -hmm. has it still has the thermal conductivity higher than mm -hmm. any other materials available to us so it's uh, it's it's fantastic application and i'm sure that we will see uh, other areas where it is being used yeah exactly okay uh one more question is about uh, uh maxine have you heard about maxine and its potential yeah so so maxines of course that's uh, those are uh those are great uh, uh, also two-dimensional materials produced in a in a different way uh, personally, I don't I don't work uh, on them, but um, but I do follow the literature and uh, and it is being being used quite uh, quite widely for um, uh, or at least tested quite widely for uh, battery applications for uh, for uh, supercapacitors. So uh, I I don't think that the the future belongs to only one material, and I hope not. 
I mm -hmm. hope that we will be using um, combinations of 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 different materials. So mm -hmm. maxins are, are quite a uh, 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 natural part of those uh, of those uh, future heterostructure materials. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe I can use uh, this last question to wrap up our session. Uh, as you, uh, when you got the Nobel Prize, right, you are very young. If I remember correctly, it's 38, 37. So among one of the youngest uh, Nobel laureates, do you have any message for the young generation, like the audience? Well, I, I always, I always uh, would like to suggest to people the only one thing is that don't don't listen to any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Just follow your own way. It is important to be excited about your own research, and then, and then uh, I, I'm sure that you will get to a success. We, uh, even though it, it looks like we understand everything, in fact, once once mm -hmm. you start getting into into details, there are so many new things to to be discovered about about any system. So. Um, just be uh, be uh, excited about what you are doing, and then I'm sure you that you will get to to a su success. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for the audience. Uh, I hope you enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you.